key interview. Y'all got to make some noise. Y'all got to get on y'all feet for the president and co-founder of Dreamville. Y'all make some noise for E. I'm working. Yeah. Hey. Like that. Big step up. Gotta have a space. Yeah. Gotta have a space. It's been a I mean, freedom. You know what I mean? We going. Uh. Yes. Oh, oh, man. We got the boss check, in the check, building. Check. How you feeling? What's up, y'all? I'm chilling. <laughs> I'm chilling, I'm chilling. You know, it's, it's, it's festival weekend. Energy is great. The city's been great. Uh, D-Day just dropped. Yeah. You that's, know, that's y'all make one. some noise. It's fire. That's a good one. <laughs> how do you, how you feel about all this right now? Uh, I feel good, man. Like, this weekend is like a family reunion for us, you know yeah. what I mean? Like, a lot of old college friends fly in. We don't get to, you know, have all our artists in one place often. So, like, seeing them the last couple of days getting drinks and hugging it up, you know, stuff like that is, is real cool. So, it's good, you know. I'm tired. But, <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah. But it's worth it, you know what I mean? So, I'm, I'm excited. I'm driving around, seeing people in Dreamville shirts, Dreamville hoodies. It's like, it's a beautiful thing. It's, cra- it's, it's great to hear, like, that energy still there, right? It, it doesn't get old to see someone in, you know, in, in a Dreamville apparel never because you you can't take it for granted like where it started from you know so it's like it just started as an idea so you know to be able to bring thousands and thousands of people into into raleigh north carolina for for a festival and you know see how it affects the city the economy the state um you know to to just know that People believe in a brand so much; they want to be a part of it. It's it's like you that's that's never that's never gonna get old. Man, that's a, that's wonderful, man. Speaking of, you know, you were talking about where things have started. I wanted to talk to you a, a bit about your start and your and your family start. And um, you know, you, tell me about your family's journey out of Sudan, like out of Sudan and like to Paris, and then you know. Yeah, well, you know, being from Sudan, I think. Um, a lot of people there, I mean, a lot of people from Africa know, like, the goal, you know, now I think it's a little different, but back then it was always to, like, get out, get yeah. out and, you know, build a better future. Yeah. And uh, my dad, he did that. Like, he he went to France, you know. I think initially he was in, in Bordeaux, like, <laughs> stepping on grapes, making <laughs> wine, like, you know, just doing whatever he has to do and and um and just kind of setting himself up to be able to bring my mom out. Mm-hmm. Um. So my my older brother, Moma, and my sister, Isra, they were born in Sudan. And by the time they moved to France was when my older brother proved myself. And, I, and obviously, Bas, we, we was born in France. So it's like, be, at that young age, we moved around a lot. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, I was, I was in Paris, and then we would go spend the summers in Sudan. And Come on. Then we moved to like Qatar for a few years. <laughs> they came back to Paris, so it was cool. Like it just gave me, it shaped my identity of the world a little differently. Yeah, I mean, you you'd already had kind of a worldview at a uh, or a sense of a worldview at a younger age, whereas you know a lot of cats don't get that opportunity. Nah, for sure. And and, and at that age, you don't realize it. You know, it's like even even um, the fact that like I was flying at such a young age. When I when I met some friends that was like, yo, I've never flown. It, it was just kind of like, wait, I don't, I didn't realize in the moment what <laughs> that was, was going normal. on. You know what I mean? Yep. <laughs> so uh, by '96, you you know you, you your family had moved to New York, right? And you know you're you're in New York. You're coming into New York with an accent. Like, what was that like for you? And it was hard. <laughs> <laughs> like, and you know, back then, like being an immigrant wasn't cool. Like now, it's kind of cool. Like now, it's like you you know, everybody rep where they from. Back then, it was like I was like the the little immigrant kid, and and it was it was definitely an adjustment. But I I love it because I was like I'm just I get dropped off in Queens. I didn't want to be there. Like I'm thinking like yo, I got my homies in Paris. Like I'm kind of lit. Like <laughs> you taking me to New York? Like what's what's going on? That's but so but it was it was dope because, you know, I I understood quickly like yo if you can, if you can get it here like if you can figure it out mm-hmm. here like you can really figure it out anywhere. anywhere and and at that age it was like, I think the 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 thing that allowed me to make friends and kind of break in is obviously the the two universal things, 
is sports and, and music, you know of what course. I mean? And, and I, I was at least a good hooper, you know what I <laughs> mean? And then real quick, I picked up on football. So I was on the yard with, with the homies. I was a receiver. I was running routes. You oh, know what I mean? So routes? I, can I curse? <laughs> I, I curse. I don't know if I'm allowed oh, to curse. Oh, you good. This right, is cool, family. Cool. We here with family. <laughs> nah, sh- nah, <laughs> I had to get that out now. Playing. But uh, yeah, sports and, and, um, and music, obviously. You know, being in New York at, at you know the, at the time was like the capital of all of, all of hip hop, you yeah. know R and B. So, you know, I think I think those things allowed me to uh, to adjust and kind of find my footing. When did you speaking of that? When did you like realize you're like, man, I love this. I love hip hop. Like, what like what was like happening? What was like unavoidable in New York that you were like, yeah? Well, it was it was so you know I my biggest influences obviously were my my siblings so Mm -hmm. you know my my sister she was the oldest she would always start with her and then my older brother Moma like we shared a room growing up and I remember when I was young like he would go every Tuesday and like buy every hip-hop album that would come out (laughs) yeah I I still see it like he had a drawer where like all his albums stacked and I would just like look play certain things I was a big like Jodeci fan like you know like I was a big like at the time, like Chris Cross was popping when Chris I was Cross a kid. Was you know what I mean? Like so, so music. I just, I just loved it. It was just, um, you know, I, I think, I think there's, there's nothing that can connect with someone more than like when the music cuts through and and it's like somebody's putting into words what you feel, but you don't know yeah. how to say it. So, I think from early, uh, it was that, and then I think the moment to your point where I was like, oh, I really love this. I think it was. Um, when I when I moved to Queens, and I remember like I just so so, I just wanted it was written so bad the, the album, <laughs> so I sent my brother to the Wiz. Yeah, too young to know. I about was about the to Wiz. say you got to. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> nobody beats the Wiz exactly. It was a it was a electronic store in New York, and like he like went and bought the album for me, and I remember because I used to play that, I used to play it so much. I would go to my to school, you know, back then it's like if you got a CD, you got to share it with oh, your friends. Oh yeah, you got to share it with everybody. And my boy Antoine, who's still one of my closest friends to this day, he he bought it back all scratched up. I was oh, like, come man. on, bro. That's the but worst. I, I remember, skipping. yeah, exactly. <laughs> Y'all don't know about that neither. Y'all they got MP3s. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? But uh, but I remember that was like the album that in my mind kind of changed everything because I just remember the feeling and. And and I just heard hip hop differently. He had the song "I Gave You Power." I remember like he was doing a whole story as the gun, and I'm like, "Damn, this is this is crazy." crazy. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah. And I was like 11 or something, but I, that was a, that was an important moment for me. Man, how so? You know, growing up, hearing that, sharing that with your family, like, how did that bond with music play a role or instrumental role, I should say, in your life? I think. Um, one, I think I think anybody that loves music knows that like sharing music and and putting someone on is like it's like a badge of honor. You oh know my god, I mean? you get late. Yeah, I be trying to see exactly. people do music. So like, I quit though. It, exactly. <laughs> so it'd be like, yo, you ain't heard about blah blah blah, and they'd be like, nah. I'd be like, all right, now you know you got them. Be like, all right, you gonna like this shit because because you know you want people to trust you and, and trust your taste. It's all right. about taste at that point. Exactly. So um, so that's kind of what it was. It was like getting put on the music early, like going to your friends. I, I like I, I remember in high school my older brother had um had a Eminem infinite tape like <laughs> way before Eminem even came out. It was like underground stuff. And I remember being like, yo, this dude is so fire. And I would tell my friends, but they hadn't heard it. And I remember one of my friends, the first song he heard was like uh How My Name is when he came with the mm-hmm. single. And he was like, bro, you talking about this? Like this is like, corny. But I was like, nah, no, nah, man. He really, <laughs> he really be rapping, and like it was like my stripe was getting pulled, you know what I mean? But so to me, it's like at that age, man, you just want to be able to. It was cool to be able to put somebody on, you know what I mean? And yeah. be on, it still is, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, it still is, you know. So that's that's what it was, man. So tell me about this transition from you know high school to college, and like what you know, what were your ambitions? Like, what did you what did you want to do with college? Where did you want to go with it? Like, what was happening? Yeah, I mean that was. That was a crazy transition because <laughs> I, I played basketball in high school and I was good, but I wasn't like that good, you know what I mean? Uh, 
I, but I was good, and we were my high school league was like one of the best like high school leagues at the time. So in my mind, I was like, I'll just go to college, play ball somewhere, yeah. and I, and I took some like visits to some like D3s, D2s, and I was like, Man, yeah, I'm not gonna do this. Like I'm not. <laughs> I got I got to figure something out. So I really didn't pick my school till July, and school was starting in August. Oh wow! But I came up because my brother had graduated from St. John's, and he was super smart. <laughs> and uh, he connected me with his dean, who thought I was as smart as my brother, but I wasn't. And and uh, ties. yeah, they, they got me in. They got me in. And, and at the time, I was just gonna be like sports agent, or I was gonna work in the front office. Oh man! And I was just kind of like what I thought. It it definitely didn't didn't go that way. I mean, I, I didn't really put the work in for me to deserve that. You know yeah. what I mean? So that was just an ambition. And um and then I just started becoming a college student and I was <laughs> missing class and hanging out on the strip. We got some you know, few you people from St. John's stuff. here. I used to be <laughs> by my gorgeous on the strip, you know, like just just chilling. Chilling, man. You was enjoying yourself. Yeah. Did you know, uh, speaking of like, you know, sports agent or working in the front office, did you know anyone that was doing that? My, my cousin who's actually out here, I don't know if he's here, but he's probably drinking somewhere in, in, a, <laughs> in Raleigh. Um, he, he had like, he was like interning at, with the Knicks, then he was working with the Hawks and then he ended up working with the Suns and we were all just such, and I obviously still am, we, we all have, you know, basketball, sports group chat. We were just such fans of the game yeah. that it was cool to see someone that you knew that, oh, you, you did this. And it was kind of like, you know, it felt doable, mm -hmm. but, uh, but it was also just cause I knew like, I love I love basketball that much. It was like, all right, if I can't play it at the highest level, maybe I could affect it some way. You know, so that was just the thought. You know yeah. what I mean? So, you know, you obviously went a different path yeah, than that. It worked out. Uh, and it worked out, right? Um, and a, a part of that path was this relationship that formed between you and J. Cole. And this yep. was, you know, y'all were playing ball together, right? Yeah, so, yeah. like, we just... We didn't really like rock with each other at first. Like we was cool, but like you know the fake cool, like yo yo what up? What's like, up? Yeah. You just go the other way. Exactly. <laughs> but we used to uh, hoop. You know, in, in my school we had this thing called Common Hour on Tuesday and Thursday. I think it was from like uh, twelve to like one thirty or something where no one had class, and and it was kind of like the moment where like all the good hoopers would show up to the gym. Yeah. And me and him always was like guarding each other because we used to talk guards. So I didn't really rock with him like that. You know what I mean? But but uh, but I knew he could hoop, and then he got cool with my boy Ted, who's also somewhere out here, probably drinking. Uh, <laughs> and um, and he started like coming around. We we would just hoop together, mm -hmm. and then we got cool towards like I don't know, maybe his junior year or something. And you know, I was from Queens, so it was it was easy for me to like, cause we did bond over like just going out and having fun and yeah, having just drinks, kicking and, it, right? Yeah, kicking it. So so at that point, it was easy for me to be like, yo. My people's is doing something here. Like, let's go over here. Let's go to the city. Cause I kind of already knew the lay of the land, and so did he. Like, he knew he he knew the city. Cause being from Queens, I didn't really go to Manhattan. Like, that was like a different state to me. Like, like you know, yeah, what I'm mean? gonna be in Queens. Yeah, till like <laughs> I got to college, and he was he was going to the city a lot. So it was like we just bonded over just hanging out, and um, yeah, that's that's what it was. It wasn't. I did, I knew, I've seen him like rap around campus, but I didn't think he was a rapper like that. Yeah, so you just thought it was like you know, yeah, like somebody like, just freestyling. Yeah, he's just freestyling. So that was just the homie, and and that's kind of how we bonded. So uh, when did you like hear something that you were like, I like you a little bit more serious than I thought? It was um, I just got in his car. I forgot what he was on. Maybe going to hoop or something. And uh, he had this freestyle over the Grammy family beat, the Kanye joint. And he was just going off. And I was like, who's this? He was like, oh, that's me. He tried to turn it off. I'm like, hold up, man. Like, let, just, <laughs> let this shit finish. Like, and he was like, nah. I was like, you rap rap? He was like, nah, but I ain't trying to tell people I'm a rapper. Because, you know, at that time, it was like everybody was a rapper. I mean, yeah. yeah and it was, was kind of like, you ain't a real rapper. So it's like, <laughs> he didn't want that stigma. He, his, but that's just who he is. And he's still like that. Like, I'm, I'm going to show you more than I'm going to tell you. Yeah. So he was like, no, nah, no, nah, I'm going to just get signed. And then people going to know. And I was like, oh, okay. I mean, it didn't, make, it didn't really make sense It didn't really me. make sense. So I was like, uh, okay. But, you know, I, it wasn't like I was like, oh, okay, I'm going to work with you. Yeah. I was just more, that was my homie. So I'm like, yo, 
I was, the, the whole thing came about because I was like, yo, you should put out a mixtape. Like, I was so, so big into mixtapes. You know what I mean? I mean, like, mixtape era. Yeah, just... like, I was on the Ave every day buying mixtapes, buying Smack DVDs. Yeah. Like, that was just my life. Like, that's, I love that. Shit. So it's like, I was like, yo, we should just do a mixtape. And he was kind of against it. But, you know, I just kind of convinced him, you already got the songs. Let's put some stuff together. Uh, again, I'm not managing, not his partner. I'm just like the homie. It's yeah, like, you just yo, like you should just do, do this. Like, like, yeah. <laughs> and um, and, and and we did that with the come up, and you know, not not that the fact that the come up is the reason he got signed or anything. It was just good for us. We had fun. You yeah, know what I mean, it was like, about the journey of yeah, like, yo, we, had we fun. completed a creative project. And, and we used project. to have we used to have this conversation. We used to always say to each other like, we just believed the deal was around the corner so much that even though it wasn't, it just kept us going. Like, it was always like, nah, you about to get signed. You, you good. Like, signed, yeah. No matter how broke we was, like, you good, you good, you about <laughs> to get signed. Like, so, um, so that's kind of how it started. Yeah. You know, it's funny you said that because I feel like when you're in this entrepreneurial journey, this creative journey, you got to convince yourself of, of those things, right? You got to see it before anyone else is going to see it. You got to be like, yeah, we're going to get signed, obviously. For sure, because <laughs> if you allow the doubt to creep in, it's easy to be like, all right, like, I'm out. You know what I mean? Because yeah. it's, it's not easy. You know what I mean? It's like, I, re I remember those moments where I'm like, all right, what am I doing here? Like, I, but, but for me, it was, it was easy because I really believed. And I was like really a fan. I was, it wasn't, there was no business idea. It was more like, I want this to win. Yeah. Okay, how can we figure that out? And it was just getting creative. Like, I started taking a camera to the studio, you know what I mean? And I was editing it terribly on Window <laughs> Movie Maker and just uploading it to YouTube. Like, it was just trying things out. Yeah. And it, and it just seemed fun. And, and, and we found fun and wins in every little thing. Mm. You know what I mean? It was never like, it, we never looked so far ahead that we couldn't enjoy a the blog moment. post. Yeah. Or like, 10 views on this video or like you know what I mean so that that was fun to us so that's kind of like but if you allow it to get to you then it's easy to be like like I remember I remember when Cole graduated and he's smart as hell like you know what I mean he, he graduated and he wouldn't get like a full time job because he was like yo I know if I go and work at like a Samsung or something huh. then his dream is over he gonna get comfortable and he's like, I can't, you know what I mean? So he was struggling, like, you know what I mean? Wow. Like, I was, I would get, like, my pops would give me, like, $10, and I would, we would just, like, split a sandwich type thing. Because to <laughs> me, it's like, I knew he, he really believed, and it's like, once, if, if you don't have that mindset, it's easy to be like, all right, I'm out. Right, right. Man, I mean, that's crazy. I was splitting sandwiches, $10, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, that's- My pops held me down. Shout out my pops. <laughs> Now, you know, we're here this weekend for, for Dreamville Festival, but I'm curious to know, like, what does the name represent? Like, where did y'all come up with that? It, it was, it was like 2007 before he got signed. Um, I just remember, you know, you young, we're rap fans. Like, we really love, we really love this thing. And I just remember being like, you know, us being like, is the feeling of like, man, Jay got Rockefeller, like Diddy got Bad Boy, right. like Cash Money, like we need our own thing, you know what I mean? And and I remember um, being in Muhammad Crib and, and Cole, <laughs> um, RJ, it was me, RJ and Cole, and, and Cole was like, yo, I got the name, uh, like Dreamville, Dreamville, like, you know, Fayetteville, City of Dream. And I remember being like, no, nah, I don't really know. Like, <laughs> you know, your first nature, your first nature is always to overthink yeah, shit. Like, yeah, I don't really know. know. And, and and RJ was like, nah, that's hard. And I was like, okay, I'm, I'm going to ride with the energy a little bit. Let me see what's going on here. And then, like, right away, I was like, damn, that is dope. And at the time, it, it wasn't a business. It wasn't like we had any paperwork or anything. It was just it was just something to rep. You yeah, know it mean? was something to rally around. Exactly. Something to to just help us, like, build an identity and build a brand. And um, And as it was growing and as it became – as we seen like the fans and the people that were coming to the show and you realize like, yo, there's, there's a certain belief people have in Cole and in his words that, you know, might make them make more sense of their day or might give them, you know, a little bit more hope. That's when it started feeling more and more real. Yeah. Cause I used to say like for the first, 
whatever, three, four years co was signed, Dreamville was a merch company, and that's about it. You know what I mean? Like, we ain't do nothing else. He's but like, we, um, but I, think the, I think the people found something in that name, and then it made it feel really real. Yeah. So tell me about, like, you're saying, like, these things are happening, you know, that's kind of the reality for, you know, three or four years. At what point did you feel like, oh, this is real, and it's, like, taking off? I mean, I kind of, like, Cole is very private, so I would see that he would, like, value my input Mm -hmm. and value my opinion on things, and then slowly see that he'll be like, yo, what do you think if I did this? And I was like, okay. So I see that I can help somewhere. But again, it's not a job. It's not like a, I'm, at this point, I'm just helping. And then um, we worked at a collection agency, <laughs> which I got on the job. Because we <laughs> first we worked at a selling ads at a newspaper. Then I, I got a job there, but then I got fired. <laughs> and then I went to the collection agency. I'm like, yo, they pay a little better over here. And I brought him in. And um, and while we were there, we really started like going to open mics, trying to get at the time was the blog era was just starting. Yeah. So just trying to get on a blog. I was like emailing like Karen Civil and her oh, wow. her faction <laughs> and, and all these blogs, like, yo, check my man out. You know what I mean? Like I was on MySpace sending messages to man, people. This is incredible. Yeah. <laughs> and uh and it was just like, even then, it was like, man, I just want to see my win. Like, that's all it was. And um, and then I remember we had a meeting with um, with G-Unit. <laughs> well, like, one of the guys that worked with G-Unit was like, yo, come to Connecticut. And he sent the address. Now, I'm from Queens. So I'm like, nah, there's only one person. He's like, yeah. There's only one person that lives in Connecticut that, I, that we should even drive for. So I'm Googling that. Back then, it was MapQuest. I'm Googling, like, Yo. I'm like, oh, 50 does live here. Like, we go to 50 crib. They, like, one of the guys, like, takes us out. We like, yo, this is crazy. And then we go back. 50's not there, but, but, um, yeah, yo's there. Shaw Money. They, like, going crazy over the music. And, and I remember because we had to ask the HR lady at our job who really rocked with me. She was, like, an incredible lady. We had to ask her, like, yo, can we take off, please? Like, yo, we get, <laughs> she was like, all right, go ahead. Yeah, you know what I mean? Whatever. Yeah, and then and then around the time when like the J thing happened, when he quit, he was just like, "Yo, like let's go." Like I was like, "I right, bet let's let's go." Like you know what I mean? Yo. So I think that's when it was like at least real enough that I'm gonna try this thing. You know, it yeah. wasn't like a position, but it didn't matter. Like I didn't care. I was like, I was like, this is fun. Yeah, I believe we'll figure it. We'll figure it out as we go. But I think that was kind of like a moment of like, I. Right, Let's go. Something's like really manifesting and happening here. Yeah. So it's like, let's go see what it's about, right? Tell me about like, you know, obviously this is different, right? It's 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 a different kind of direction. Did you have any mentors? Did you have any people that you were like, yo, we're trying to get this done. Can you like help me? Like, what should we do here? Yeah, I mean, getting in, then you start meeting people. So obviously at the time, Mark, Mark Pitts. And Wayne Barrow, by storm, they was managing Cole. So, like, I got to ask them questions, like, you know what I mean? Like, see how things work. Just Julius Garcia, my guy, like, he would just, you know, help me walk through things or understand things. And then um, No ID, because No ID was really the first session we ever had Hmm. with, like, another producer. It was, like, 2009. And, like... We used to make a joke like, yo, when we book a session with no ID, we need to book. If we're going in for two days, we need to book for five days because we know the first three days is just going to be talking. Like, we just, we just going to have in. our talk. We're going to vent. We're going to do whatever. But I think our relationship with him was big. And then Shaka Pilgrim, who I love, she like, she didn't hold no punches. And she was just, she really cared for us. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like she seen something in this. So it was... It was just like, I think those four people and then eventually Joey, um, you know, I think those people were like people on the music side and the record side that I could ask questions to. And that was big, you know what I mean? Because, again, I still wasn't his manager. I was just learning. You just learning. Yeah, so that, that was big. Man, so you, I, I can imagine that's pretty crazy. Like, you're probably just like thinking like, man, whatever, I'm learning. You know, yeah. we'll figure it out. It's like, you know, an undefined direction or whatnot. Um, 
at what point did y'all think about adding artists to the roster of Dreamville and like being like, okay, we're gonna be a label? It, you know, it's like you think that's the next step, but I don't think we were. Well, first off, we <laughs> in like 2010 or something like that. We had a show. You no, know, Cole was like hot off the warm up, but like internet hot. You know what I mean? Like not real life hot yet. And we uh, we in LA, and this group you and I had um yeah had a release party, and we just pulled up. And Cole, they asked Cole, like, you know, Cole's now like the new hot internet guy. And they was like, yo, can you do a joint? Cole goes up there, does lights, please, stars born verse, blah, blah. And then um, and then this other kid comes up and he's killing. And we like, who is that? And Cole's like, I want to sign him. It was Kendrick. So we did <laughs> we definitely didn't sign him. <laughs> we definitely couldn't sign him. But that I think that was like one of the times, like, you know, like that was the first person where we was like, because we didn't know who he was. Yeah. And then that's how they started getting cool. But even then, that was like 2010. Even then, it was always the idea, like, you need artists to grow this collective. And Cole and Omen was always like, Cole, Cole Omen and Elite met when they were like 16 on like, wow. Uh, what do you call it? Um, forms, Cannabis Central Forms, because they was all cannabis fans. Yeah. Which, was weird to me, but I was like, all right, like they like got on, you know, you write, you type out your bars, like you battling. I was like, y'all really did that? Like that was crazy to me. But but that's how they met. And I think Omen was like the first, even though he had his own thing, like that was like the first, like him and the league was like the first collective kind of thing. Yeah. Uh but it wasn't ever it wasn't real till I think it was after Born Center when Joey, Joey Manda was my guy, he like approached us. He was just going from Dev Jam to Interscope. Mm -hmm. And he was like, y'all want to give y'all a label deal? He told Cole, and Cole was like, yo, let me bring Eben. We talked about it. And that was like the first time we was like, all right, like, you know, that could be something. You know what I mean? Like, I think we there was always a plan of getting there, but he put the battery in our back because he had given Ross his MMG deal. Wow. So like, you know, and he he just understood the idea of partnering up with people and letting them do their thing. Yeah. So that was like the first thing. And then after that, we had another label, uh, Atlantic, that was on the same thing. And then it was just became about like making the right decision kind of thing. Yeah. So what all goes into to that decision? And you know, I'm, it's probably a multi-layered question and probably a multi-layered response in that, you know, part is like, why not? the independent route, you know, that's a big conversation right now. And then why did you end up going with who you went with? I mean, the independent route was for sure not going to happen. Because mm. the reality is you need the money to, to make your, your ideas come to life. And we didn't have that money. Like, yeah, Cole was making money, but he didn't have the money to be like, I'm just going to fund the fund label. The whole label. And I wouldn't even ask him that, you know what I mean? So it's like, to me, it's like, I just knew right away, like, we need the money. Like, that's just the reality. Yeah. It costs money to shoot videos. It costs money to put people in the studio. It costs money to, you know, put people on tour when they're not getting paid like that. So we knew we needed the money. Um, so that was the first reason. The reason I think for Interscope at that time over Atlantic, it was like a comfort. Like, you know what I mean? Like, it was just a gut decision. And it was really that, at the time, at least in our head, like it was like, yo, Atlantic was pumping out hits, 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 hits. <laughs> and we like, man, we don't really want to go somewhere where we have the pressure to make a hit. Yeah. Like we knew we wanted to build our artists a certain way. And we felt like there was a better understanding with Interscope that like, this might take a long time. This might be a slow build. Mm -hmm. So we don't like, so we don't really um, sacrifice the integrity of what we're trying to do. And I think they got that and it, you know, it relieves a little pressure. But also, like, it gives us the comfort to know, like, okay, if they're going to get it, they're going to give us the time to, like, allow us to build these artists. Because, you know, like, a hit, you can get a hit and be gone tomorrow. You know, if you, if you want to build a career, it might take longer. But once you get there, you're going to stay there longer. Right. So that was always the idea. And we just felt more comfortable in the scope. Did you ever feel a sense to have a, a, a certain pressure around making a certain type of music? in order to achieve some sort of popularity? Well, I mean, no, because 
I think our experience once we got signed was so like eye opening mm. and so like damn this is a little tougher than I thought that it made us feel like we don't want this for someone else you know yeah. what I mean not that I, I blame anyone or think anybody did anything wrong I think I think it, it helped us you know down the line but it was just a reality like oh, this is the way the music industry's been doing things let's try to like do something that's more true to us so it was more so as long as we really believed and we were really fans of the music then it's like all right let, how do we help do whatever we can to make whether it's make the music better make the vision better make the ideas better or just put it in front of as many people yeah. um that's really what it came down to it's like do we love it yeah okay cool like that's really and and, and it's a difference between knowing something that's really good yeah and loving it you know what That's I mean? True. Like, there's people out there that can sing better than anybody, but you don't connect. You know what I mean? There's there's, there's homies out there, there's, there's women out there that could write raps better than anyone, hmm. but you just don't connect. So to me, like, that connectivity was always the biggest thing. And I think that's kind of like what we banked on. It's like, does it connect with me? Because if it connects with you, then you got to trust that it's going to connect with, with other people. the people that rock with you. You know what right. I mean? Because then you just at least assume or hope that we're all like-minded in a sense. You know what I mean? So um, that was kind of the idea. It was never the pressure of doing some things or like making, you know, certain type of music. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, because, you know, you hear the stories of like, oh, you got to make a record like this or you got to make a sound like this in order to be successful. Um, but, you know, clearly Dreamville has found its, its very much own pocket in this, in this world. Um, as you building out this roster, you end up, Signing your brother to the to Thanks. the label, <laughs> boss, right? Now he ain't even here. He came to support me. Yeah, he out here drinking the everyday people. <laughs> was it? Uh, uh, were you hard on him about like if you were gonna bring him onto the label or not, or if he was ready? Were like, was there just a certain type of pressure that he had? Nah, because it was never a conversation. It wasn't like, yeah, I want to get signed. Boss actually did not. I don't want to say did not care. He wasn't about like getting signed. He didn't grow up on the same hip hop rules. Hmm. You know what I mean? In yeah. the sense that we grew up on. He was more, his music knowledge and his ear for music was way more diverse and and like just he he heard it, he heard things differently than me. But you know what I mean? Obviously we grew up on the same stuff. So he didn't have the same rule. It was like the generation right on us. Like me, me and no idea. And Cole used to always talk about hip hop rules, like how it's the worst. Hip hop rules are the worst. But like, it's just things you grew up on. Like, I can't do this. I can't do that. Like, that's not hip hop. It's like, nah. Like, you know, Boss didn't grow up with that. So it wasn't about getting signed. It was just, he just started making music on some drunk shit, like with his friends. <laughs> and right away, he was like, yeah, he's kind of good. Like, and then he, I remember him sending me something when we was working on Born Center and me being like, damn, this is actually pretty good like hmm. and i remember being like i was gonna play for cole at some point and playing it for cole he was like oh like i didn't know he was actually like you know some people naturally have it yes because he had it. started rapping like six months before that he didn't grow up rapping <laughs> he started rapping at like 24 or something like that like something crazy <laughs> 22 or whatever it was so it wasn't like he grew up on it and i just remember cole being like yo he's really like six months away from really being so then it was kind of like, yo, just do your thing. And I remember Salam, Remy really messed with it. He was interested in no ID. And as he just kept getting better, it was like, all right, this makes sense. But again, I didn't want anybody to think, oh, he got signed because he's my brother. Right. I, was, I didn't want that for him or for the label. Yeah, right, right. So, so we just didn't really speak about it. You know what I mean? Until eventually people knew, people got it. But to me, it was more important that he could stand on his, on his own. own and we don't look like the label is just like, out here signing family because that's not why he got signed. He got signed because he was really good and it connected. You know what I mean? So it was it was no extra pressure, different pressure. Like I I can easily obviously treat him as my brother and 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 someone I love as a brother, but then know like as an artist I have to talk to him differently. You know what I mean? Because mm -hmm. it would be unfair if I didn't right. to him, yeah, and to me, to everybody. You got to be honest with him about you for know, sure the quality of the work. Yeah, for sure. You know, I, I imagine there's been some interesting conversations there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll argue. It's fun. <laughs>
No, you you've spoken a lot about you know your approach to music is like you know this connectedness, some of, some of these intangibles. When it comes to thinking about artists that might work with Dreamville, can you expand upon like what does that actually look like, right? Like what is what are some of the things that get y'all's attention as a label? I think um, it's, it sounds very like. Not cheesy, but it sounds very vague. But I just think our uh, everybody on our label is like rooted in a reality. You know what I mean? It's like I don't really ever feel like, oh, he's playing a role or she's playing a role. You know what I mean? I feel mm-hmm. like like they're them, and then because they're them, people find them and connect with them because they see themselves in that. You know, mm-hmm. it started with Cole. Cole is so rooted in his own reality and who he is at all time that. The people that love him, the reason why they love him so much is because they feel that way. And the people that don't get it is because that's not their reality. Yeah. So they can't understand that. Um, and and to me, even like whether it's Cole or myself or, you know, I think a, I think a lot of our reality was we was right in that middle. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like we grew up, you know, we grew up in 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 the middle where it's like I I played ball, I hung with the niggas that was in a in a different situation that I was. I didn't grow up in like a rich household, but it was just middle class, like you know what I mean? And and I think you you get to see both worlds. You get to see you stand and I think that's where most people are. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> majority uh is not trappers. Like that's just not a reality. It's not a reality. Yeah. You know what I mean? That that's the reality to a small group of people. And and the majority of people that we grew up around are not rich. So we were like that middle ground that I think, even though obviously Cole and I grew up in different situations, but at least when we linked and whatever, I think that's kind of like almost where all of our artists sit. You know what I mean? Whether whether they grew up in a, you know, a poor household or not, like the core of it is like this reality of like, is that duality. You yeah. know what I mean? And I think Cole, whole brand coming in was that duality of the, Horns and the halos, you know what I mean? And I feel like a lot of our artists have that. They're like, mm. nobody's trying to play the perfect role or play a role, and you see their flaws and you see their their high moments, and I think that makes people relate because end of the day, it's like you don't relate to someone that's always perfect because that's just not reality. It's not real. You know what I mean? And and you don't want to relate to someone that's always f***ing up because right? <laughs> you don't want to be that. Uh, so I think that's kind of like that middle rooted in reality that I feel like a lot of our artists have. Yeah. You know, I'm sure you get, you know, a lot of these questions around, you know, folks that are emerging and, and trying to get in. Um, what what kind of guidance would you offer for someone who might be trying to sign a, a distribution deal um, or get signed in general, um, like, but they're not sure what they might be getting into? Man, the game is so different. Like, <laughs> the game has changed so much. Um, it's tough because I think every situation is different for for everyone. You know what I mean? First of all, it's like, what do you want out of this? There's people that are literally just rapping because they want to make money. So then just chase the money. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, get your bag. However you got to get that. There's people that rap because it's, a, it's therapy to them. You know what I mean? There's people that rap because they want to be the greatest. Everybody like, or sing. You know what I mean? Same thing. Um, even writers, like everybody does it for a different reason. So so it's different for everyone. You know what I mean? I think I think that's why it's hard to answer that question. But to me, it's like you gotta know what you want for yourself first and then and then kind of like go off of that. Cause you're what you if you wanna be the greatest, you can't use the same roadmap as the one that just wants to get paid. Right, right, right. So it's, it's like you gotta know that for that's first step. Like you gotta know that. And then I think um and then I think it changes a little bit of what you look for. But as far as like indie or sign, like I get it. Like, you know, people might feel like it's a, it, at the end of the day, it's a give and take. You sign to a label, you're giving up something because you want their money. Mm-hmm. Or certain labels, which I believe we where those labels, you want like their input, their creativity, their like, their values, whatever it is. But yeah. for the most part, when you sign to a major, I won't even talk about like the, you know, labels like us that are 
that have a partnership with a major. But when you sign to a major, you're signing to them because one, there's creative people in those buildings. There's people that know what they're doing, but you need the money. And if you need the money, you got to give something up. You can't go to a bank like, yo, give me a hundred million. And they're like, yeah, cool. Like, you know what I mean? Like, they gonna want something back. They gonna want something back. And, and that's, that's what a label is, you know, at the core of it. And then, of course, there's people in those labels that really care, that really love what they do, so they're gonna offer something. And um, so to me, it starts with like, you gotta know what you want, and then you can make a decision from that. Yeah. And I think speaking of, once you, you know, you kind of figure that out, there's this whole aspect, and you touched on it a little bit on on the marketing side of things that you've seen like different eras of music and marketing and strategy like you talked about the blog era we talked about mixtapes then there's streaming there's you know uh tiktok like what like all of this stuff is happening is there a place that you could focus as an artist or is it just like well you know I what's think authentic? You, i think you have to grow hmm. like in in the whatever has been now uh, 13 years I've been around this. It's like I've seen like five different music industries. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like when we started, people was going to the store and then some people was on iTunes. Like by the time Cole dropped his first album, most people was on iTunes. Half of them was going to the store. Um, by the time he dropped his second album, you the store was still prevalent, but you had to go to like a few stores to find the CDs. You know what I mean? Like, yo, y'all got Born Center? Nah, not today. All right, cool. Let me go to the next. Like, you started seeing stores be like, this is not a lucrative business for mm. us to buy CDs. By the time we got to Four Sales Drive, it was like, it was just iTunes. iTunes. And then still some CDs, but it was mostly iTunes. And then I remember because around Four Sales Drive, it was only Spotify around and it had just kind of like popped off in the US. And I remember Cold Four Cell Drive did like 11 million streams the first week. Jeez. And it was the most all time, wow. which is like insane now yeah, because insane. every week now somebody's doing 400 million yeah. streams the first <laughs> the week. Keep crazy. So it's like, that's just how much the game has changed. We see it was like that by the time we dropped Four Yards Only, CDs was gone. Like CDs didn't even exist damn near. And it was, it was iTunes. And streaming was starting to get heavy, but Apple Music still wasn't there. Then Apple Music came and Tidal. Now it's like no one goes to iTunes. And now vinyls are coming back. So it's like <laughs> you, you that like in those years, it's like you have to adjust. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Even when you mentioned TikTok, it's like people be like, TikTok is ruining the game. Like now nah, you just gotta adjust. You gotta make TikTok work for you. Like mm. I don't I don't have the answer. You know what I mean? I just know that like if you can make TikTok work for you, it's an incredible tool. Like, I go on TikTok, you can waste 45 minutes on there. I just be Man, laughing. Just You know what I mean? Because constantly. people are geniuses on that shit. Like, they just know. So it's like, you just got to make it work for you. And if you don't want to adapt, I remember when there was some artist when streaming was popping up, like, I'm not streaming my album, only iTunes. It's like, all right, you're out of here. Like, you know what I <laughs> mean? So it's like, you just got to adjust because you're not going to stop technology. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, it ain't like all the artists are getting together in the living room, like, we're not going to stream. Like, nah, they're going to stream. Like, you're one artist. You're not going to stop the movement. You're movie. not going to change the whole nah. business. So you just got to adjust. You got to adjust with the with the movement. And it's, it's always different. Like, we had to, like, I'm sure there's some fans here that been around for a long time. And they used to go, I remember that first time, they used to go and buy 10 of them, 15 of them. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah, 20 yeah. of them. <laughs> When you lose that, you got to adjust. Like, now you got to find other ways to keep them that excited. Um, so you, you always have to move with the times. And um, we came from the blog era where it was like we would do a song, upload it to a, a Cinch Space or a Z-Share link, yeah. tweet it out. The link dies in 20 minutes. <laughs> you know what I mean? And then, like, so now we got to adjust. Like, even putting this mixtape together. Yeah. Like, that, I just really wanted that feeling. And thank God, you know, Interscope were holding me down. But it's like, if if it would have took like a week or two weeks more for clearances and stuff, like it might have not felt the same. But like, you know, we were able to make it happen. And, and like, so you have to adjust. That's all it is. Like, you can't feel like you're bigger. You're not bigger than technology. That's no, for sure. So you got to like, keep moving. You got to keep moving with the time. Man. So I got I got I got one last question for you before we go go to the audience and I wanted to ask you about you know so many of us find comfort in hip hop as a 
art form as well as as a culture. Um, but some also argue that, you know, the space might be contributing to, you know, a, a fatal lifestyle, right? And so I wanted to get your opinion on, like, what do you think about that duality? Like, I mean, I think if if artists are speaking their reality and it really is really rooted in their reality, then you need you need all those aspects. You know what I mean? Like, there's certain artists, their reality is not the same as mine. So when I hear their music, it kind of gives me more of an insight of what they're going on. And those artists are usually the ones that'll tell you, like, I don't like this lifestyle I'm living, or I don't, I go through these things, but like, this is what I came up on, this is what it is. And like, it gives you more of an understanding, because then it's, then you can understand, like, how you can help the next ones coming up to not have them in that same situation. But I think what's more so the detrimental thing is the artists that are not living in their reality and they're playing that role because then that's just glorifying it. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. Like, like I'm a, I'm a big like Kodak fan. Mm -hmm. I think Kodak is living in his reality. Mm -hmm. So you get to see the Kodak that might rub people the wrong way and you also get to see a side of him where he's like, man, like, you know, like, like you get to see a real side of him that sometimes you're like, I don't like that I'm doing this. Like, so to me, that's the reality that you need because it gives you a better understanding. Then there's some other artists that just, they just glorifying it. They just out there like living a false life. Trying to you get paid. You know what I mean? Trying to get paid because they're like, oh, if I do that, it's going to work for me. That I think is more detrimental. Um, and it's the same way where like, Artists that want to be, that want to speak on, you know, things that are happening. Mm -hmm. And it's like, if that's not true to you, that's detrimental. Mm -hmm. Like, don't be the fake activist in your rap. Mm -hmm. Because we're going to see through that. Mm -hmm. Only speak, like, I don't want, you know, when something happens and everybody's like, oh, why didn't such and such speak on it? Because it didn't relate to him or he didn't feel it enough to speak on it. And I don't want you to fake speak on it. You know what I mean? Because then it's not real. And then we all... You know, and and that's what that's what Twitter ends up. You know, <laughs> the fake woke elitist. You know what I mean? Like, and 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 you don't want that. So I think it goes both ways. Like, if you speak in your reality, like, you know, th those people that should be talking on on things that impact our society, the right people will be talking on that. Those people that are going through some hard times in 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 their environment, in their product of their environments, the right people will speak on that. They give us a better understanding. To me, it's like you just gotta be real with yourself and give off your reality. And people might like it and people might not like it. But no, not it's nobody's supposed to, everybody can't love just one person. Like, you know what I mean? Like people we hate Beyonce. Like, yeah, Beyonce's exactly. like, she damn near perfect. Like, we ain't never seen her do nothing wrong. <laughs> but like people still gonna hate her, people gonna hate Cole, people gonna hate Drake. Like, that's just inevitable. So yeah. it's like you just gotta live in your reality. And um I think that, to me, is the biggest part because then whether it's something that I, I can't relate with, it'll just give me a better understanding. And then maybe it's like, well, I don't want them to have to go through what you went through because you explained it to me in a way where I can feel you in a way where it's like, damn, that. because a lot of times it's not, it's not just all their fault. Yeah, you know, it's just the They are a product of their environment and circumstances. And you can't, you can't like demonize them for that. 